we are in you. And we know that you have a word for us, and your word for us means life, eternal life. And we want to really accept your word in our hearts. Search through your word. And as we find life, continue to live with you. We thank you for the message that you have for us today. Yes. We thank you for Nikola. We ask that you bless him. And we ask that you bless us in your holy name. Amen. 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 Thank you for the prayer, Pastor Marino. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship. Sister Milka, thank you for encouraging message. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this wonderful Sunday. I would like to speak today on a, on a topic, we are blessed because he was not. <laughs> and uh, I choose a verse from Matthew 27, even we will see in a wider context, 46, when he's saying, my God, my God, why you have forsaken me? And before I start preaching, I would like to confess how I feel about the words that I have to preach. It's, I feel undignified to preach this sermon. And uh, from reason, because my Savior spoke those words from a cross, and I have to spoke from a pulpit. His clothes was torn by a beast, by an enemy, and I'm here in a shiny, you know, perfumed, uh, clothes. He was surrounded by enemies, me with you brothers and sisters, with dear friends and family. So there is a heaviness when you preach or say something from the cross, depends of saying from a, from a pulpit. But how this could be? Have you ever wondered what does it mean to be under a curse? In my culture, Curse has very wide meanings and ideas. For example, someone with the help of witchcraft has put a spell on you, so you have been cursed. Or by use of black magic, made you to not prosper or constantly bad things to happen to you. But despite of culture sayings, what really means to be under a curse? And to be more clear, what does it mean to not be cursed by man, but to be cursed by God? The best words which can describe the severeness and heaviness of this curse are spoken by the bruised lips of our Savior when he said, my God, my God, why you have forsaken me. I will read from Matthew 27, verses 32 till 46. So please join me. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the school. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of Jews. Two rebels was crucified with him, one on, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You are going to destroy the temple and build in three days. Save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. 
In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Reading this particular text, I find out very useful to ask myself two very important questions. And the first is, why did Christ, what did Christ experience here? And the second question is, why? These troubled words of Christ are among the most significant words that Christ ever spoke. There is infinite world of theology. It's a one sentence, but so rich and deep in meaning. What we have seen here, it's an agony above all agonies. Christ was forsaken by his Father on account for our sin. What happens in those moments, God turned from loving him perfectly to a judging him perfectly. He cried out those words because there is real forsakenness for our sake. To be forsaken of God is a cry of doom, and he was doomed for us. Verse 44, 45, pardon me, telling us from noon till three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. <clears throat> so, Jesus has spoken at least three times before this darkness fell down. While they are crucifying him, he repeatedly prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. In Luke 23, he has spoken to the repentant thief on the cross and assured him a place in the paradise in the same chapter of Luke. He had given his mother in care of his beloved disciple, John. Then the darkness came and this moment what we are reading now. So it's a Friday noon where darkness fell over the scene of a crucifixion like a heavy curtain. <clears throat> and maybe we wonder what kind of mysterious darkness is this? This is a intense, a supernatural darkness that came over the land. God took away the light. The midday became like a midnight. The only way how we can understand this darkness, this phenomenon, is that the Holy God, the Mighty One, sent this darkness. It's not just a cloud who covered the, the sun. So what's, what's the meaning of, of this darkness? Darkness oftentimes associated in the scripture with the sin. And uh, <clears throat> light stands for holiness. Darkness is a symbol of a God's judgment upon the sin. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. People of God are children of light and people of Satan are compared with the children of darkness. But this strange darkness is also a fearful darkness. It's a foretaste of hell. It's a darkness of agony and sorrow. It's a darkness of condemnation, the darkness of the wrath of God. And now, please listen carefully, in this fearful darkness, the one who is light of lights, enter in this darkness without word of objection to wrestle with it, but with the absent father. His mother was there, but in hour of his greatest need, his father abandoned him. He wasn't there. In this moment, he became a sin, he who don't know sin. He became a cursed one, not beloved one. So what did Christ also experience on the cross? Jesus suffered physically. 
His shoulders was carrying the cross, nails was pierced in his hands. His head was crowned with a thorn. He was beaten and tortured. He suffered emotionally also. As he was hanged up on the cross, people mocked him. They were joking with him. Soldiers mock him when they say, prophesy to us who hit you. Priests mocked him as he laid his life as a sacrifice for his people. Roman soldiers mocked him when they said, Hail the King of the Jews. He suffered from all kinds of men, starting like a governor, like a pilot, king like Herod, friend like Judah. He suffered from people who passed by. The Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, all combined add a pain to his sufferings. Isaiah 53, verse 7, telling us, He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its sharers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. So, just imagine, Christ on the cross endured an in incredible, deep physical and mental sorrow in the hands of an evil man. Yet, he never spoke a word. He never said word of complaint. But when God turned away from him, then Christ cried, My God, my God, why you have forsaken me? Let me suggest why I believe that this is one of the greatest agony, why he, what he experienced. Because he never been forsaken by his father. Others has forsaken Christ before. We read in John 6, some who profess to be his disciples, after hearing uh, heavy teachings from Christ, they just leave him, they depart from him. In Matthew 26, we read, the disciples in Garden of Gethsemane, leaving, forsaking him, and fleeing away. So, Christ was taken to the hall of judgment. He was forsaken by an intimate friend for a 30 silver coins. So, it's not that the Christ have not been forsaken before. He had been. But none of those moments has wounded him as being forsaken by his father. So this is like a new thing to Christ. From eternity, when Christ was with the father, until this point of history or time, there was unbroken fellowship between the father and the son. And it happened when Christ was surrounded by a bitter enemies. So, the father abandoned him while he was dying for his people. You and I think about our deathbed, last hour before die. One thing what we long for beside a favorable presence of our Savior is to be surrounded by a loving family and friends. One thing what we don't like is to die alone. And to die forsaken. As Jesus was dying on the cross, that was he pronounced the most agonizing words what man can spoke. My God, my God, why you have forsaken? And only echo of that voice was, was heard. This is a moment of a great unanswered prayer for Christ. We read in Psalm 21, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. And the psalm is continuing. So, Christ did not just 
who take the 21st Psalm, but he experienced on himself what means to be forsaken. This cry he addressed to his beloved father. In the hour of a greatest need, God doesn't help him. My God, my God, why you have forsaken me? On the Mount of Transfiguration, we remember, there was a voice of heaven. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In Gethsemane, when Jesus prayed and was exhausted, God sent the angel to minister to him. But here, But here no voice was heard from the Father, no favor was shown to him, no grace was extended to him, to be extended to me and to you. He experienced forsakenness, for we may never be forsaken of God. Yes, there will be a time when you will experience distress and sorrow and pain, when enemies will come to you, and your tears will ask, where is your God? And you might feel forsaken, and you might feel, my God, my God, why you have forsaken me? But you never experience the fact of forsakenness. He experienced a horror of a real abandonment so you, dear child of God, may never be forsaken of God. Let me show you what God has promised in Isaiah 49, 14 till 15. The Israelites was complaining that they were forsaken by God. So on this, God says, but Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb, even this may forget, yet I will not forget you. So we came to a point of a, why God has forsaken his son. Because this is the only way how he can save those who sin against him. Without shedding a blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrew 9.22 Look, dear brothers and sisters, God gives us hands to work and we use them to sin against Him. God gives us a foot to walk and we use those foot to walk away to Him. And instead to repay this back he gives us his son. What kind of beauty is ready to be found on the cross? When we were without strength, Christ died for ungodly in Romans 5, 6. And maybe we are asking why Jesus experienced this forsakenness? What's the main reason for him to be forsaken? Again in Isaiah 54, 10 verse, telling us it pleased Lord to bruise him. So it was God the Father who in, in love in this evil and fallen world give his own son. Let's go back to the curses, the question what I mentioned on the beginning. And what does it mean to be cursed? And practically cursed by God. Let me bring to your, your attention a few Bible verses. For example, Deuteronomy 4.1 is saying this. Now Israel, hear the decrees and laws I am about to teach you. <clears throat> now, follow them so that you may live. So follow the laws so you may live. And may go in and take the possessions of the land the Lord the God of your ancestors is giving you. So the law is very clear. Do this and you will live. But you have to be blameless, you have to be perfect. 
if you want to live, then you obey the law. So the question is, what happens if we don't? What happens if we don't obey the law? The answer is found in Galatians 3.10-13. to So, <clears throat> for all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So, by the law, if any person is seeking to have right standing before God, or to be righteous, through the obedience of the law, the Bible says it's under curse. Let me explain why. Because those who live by the law must obey the law. Law demands obedience, and you will live. And if you have broken any commandment, you are under the curse of the law. So, what does it mean to be under curse? This is not a curse under jurisdiction of man, but it's a curse under jurisdiction of God. What does it mean, with other words, to be cursed by God? Because of our sin and rebellion against God, we have become so lawless, so loathsome, not only before the Holy God, but for any inhabitant in heaven who is holy. We are so loathsome in our sin that when we take our first step in hell, we deserve to hear all holy creation standing before the Holy God and applauding Him for reading the earth from us. This curse is a very serious thing that you and I were under it. It's because all of our transgressions and sins against our God. But look what does it say in verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Dear brothers and sisters, do we have idea what this means in regard to what Christ suffered on the cross? When he cried out, my God, my God why you have forsaken me because he became a curse in our place in order to explain this i would like to invite you in the book of deuteronomy 27th and 28th chapter we will not read them both but i will try to to retell so there are two very significant mountains mentioned here one is a mount of gerasim and the mount of Ebal. Mount of Gerasim is known as a mount of blessings and Mount of Gerasim is a mount of curses, okay? The Israel as a nation is divided in two parts. In the one part it's a six tribes who are standing on a Mount of Gerasim. Those who stand on a Mount of Gerasim has to pronounce the blessings which will fall upon the head of a covenant keeper. Or, with other words, the blessings which will fall upon a head for a man who is obedient to the holy law of God. Okay? The rest, the rest six tribes are on the mountain Gerasim. Those has to pronounce all curses which will fall upon a head on a man who is disobedient of the law of God. Okay? So, they have to cry out all those curses. 
I'm going to read just a few of them so you may have idea, but in a context of what Christ experienced on the cross. Let me show you something. When Christ was on the cross, all sins of his people was imputed on him, and every curse which should have fallen upon his people have fallen upon him when he cried, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And God, who abandoned him, answers back. So here are the curses. The Lord your God damns you. The Lord sent upon you curses, confusion, rebuke, until you are destroyed, until you perish quickly. The Lord smites you with madness and blindness and anxious mind. At the midday you will grow up like a blind man in the dark, with no one to save you. The Lord delight to be destroyed and perished, and you will be torn from the land. Cursed you will be in the city, cursed you will be in the field. Cursed you will be when you come, and cursed when you go out. The sky which is over your head will be bronzed, and the ground beneath you iron. You will become a thing of horror, by word, and an object of ridicule among all people. Let all these curses fall upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed, because you did not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commandments, which he commanded you. So, this is what we deserve to hear on a day of judgment. This is the only voice what you and me deserve to hear from God. This is the, but this voice fell upon his son. As Christ bore our sins upon Calvary, he was cursed as a man who made an idol and set it up in secret. He was cursed as a one who dishonors his father or mother, who moves his neighbor, neighbor boundary. He was cursed as the one who misleads a blind person on the road. He was cursed as one who withholds a justice from a foreigner, fatherless, or widow. He was cursed as the one who is guilty in every manner of immorality and perversion. He was cursed as the one who wound his neighbor in secret, who accepts bribe to strike down innocent. He was cursed as anyone who does not uphold the words of the law by carrying them out. So what he did to be cursed? When he was on the cross, he bore your and my sin. He who do not know sin became sin, and the judgment of God Almighty fell upon him. I want to show you some beauty also in the book of Numbers chapter 6. Oftentimes we sing those words. So Numbers 6 verse 4. And here it's a something opposite of, of curse. It's saying this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And there is no amen for curses and there is amen for blessings. Amen. 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 Okay. Now we have problem. That's not a problem, but, but we have problem. How can a holy God bless weak and sinful people? On a which on a which base God can pronounce those curses? How can perfectly righteous God pronounce a blessings upon a head of people who have broken his covenant? Oftentimes we hear people saying and we are saying and nothing wrong in it, when we will ask, How are you, dear brother and sister? And we will hear, Oh, I am blessed. And we are really blessed, and that's a, that's a true, true statement. But 
Yes, you are blessed because he was cursed. Yes, you are blessed because he was not. We are blessed because he was cursed. Every good thing came from the, from the father upon the head of his children because every horrible thing fell upon his son. We are blessed because he was not. The dying thief on the cross will be remembered because Christ's name was forsaken. What we have seen on Golgotha, it's a God execution upon his own son and the wrath of God breaking upon the head of his own son instead upon us. You know the Old Testament sacrifice system? Many times when sacrifice will be offered to God, fire will come down from heaven like in a time of Elijah and consume the sacrifice but not a man. Same happens on a Golgotha. Fire came down from God and consumed the sacrifice, but not a man. Man was saved, sinner was set free. So Jesus might say the words, it is finished. May God bless you.